Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about video games. 2020 is finally over. I had a lot of time to play games over the past 12 months and I played, though not necessarily finished, 37 releases from this year. Here are the 10 that I liked the best. A common theme from my favorites of this year are games that let me freely travel the world, going wherever I please. They let me explore and meet new people. Or in the case of number 10, eat new people. Tripwire Interactive's Maneater is a game I was interested in from the time it was first announced, back at the PC gaming show at E3 in 2018. It's a shark PG. You start out as a baby bull shark, and as you eat and grow, you get new abilities from a talent tree and take on increasingly dangerous foes. Make no mistake, this is an incredibly silly game with a silly revenge story and it's narrated by Chris Parnell in reality TV fashion. But there was always something so nice about just swimming through the ocean and enjoying the local wildlife. In more ways than one. The game is nice to look at, everything is bright and colorful, it feels so good to take out both random beachgoers and the more challenging lineup of shark hunters you need to work your way through before you finally face your nemesis who killed your mother. There are quests and collectibles to find, and you can tailor your shark to be electric, bone armored, or maybe more stealthy. It's an amusing and lighthearted way to spend a few afternoons. Number 9 is a very creative take on using evolving game mechanics to represent character development. Signs of the Sojourner is the debut from developer Echo Dog Games and is a very interesting take on deck building, where a card game represents a conversation. You play the new owner of a small shop in your hometown, tasked with traveling around in a caravan to trade. Your starting deck of 10 cards changes as you meet and talk to new people. After each dialogue, you have to gain a new card and get rid of an old one. These card conversations are cooperative rather than competitive. You want to match as many cards as you can. But as you travel more and your deck continues to evolve, you'll find sometimes that means you can no longer succeed at conversations with people you've known from the start. The cards themselves are quite simple, with just a few symbols on them, but as you progress, you get more types of abilities that make things more interesting. I loved that the game made you make hard choices with your deck. Being a generalist and trying to build a deck to please everyone just doesn't work. You need one that will make you successful in some towns, but not others, and it's a really cool look at how communication and language change and grow. Also, you get a very good dog. I love computer role-playing games and a good post-apocalyptic landscape to explore. So number eight is a game I was really looking forward to. Wasteland 3 was developed by InXile and improves upon the last entry in the series in pretty much every way. As the Desert Rangers, you arrive in the frozen wasteland of Colorado, and you don't receive a particularly warm welcome. You explore the area in an armored vehicle, meeting the various factions and deciding who is worth allying with and who needs to be destroyed. I love this game's particular satire of 80s American culture. Coming across the Gippers, who control the region's oil and worship the AI brain of Ronald Reagan, was good for a number of laughs. I really like the style of this game. The major characters you talk to get close-ups and are fully voiced, and the biggest moments and fights are set to very well-chosen music. Easter eggs and little in-jokes can be found everywhere. The turn-based combat is solid and often challenging. There's also some base building and recruitment to do to get the rangers up and running. Wasteland 3 certainly gave me my CRPG fix for this year. Number 9 
Number seven is just the kind of relaxing and romantic adventure I was looking for at the end of this year. Haven by the Game Bakers is a lovely game where you travel around a mysteriously abandoned planet, exploring, collecting, and surviving. You play you and Kay, two young adults who ran away from their home planet because they were in love, but both were set to be paired with other people. At times, the game functions like a visual novel as you see you and Kay conversing, flirting, and discussing their situation. There's also a lot of smooching in this game. But most of the time, you'll be exploring as you glide across the planet's surface, looking for ways to fix your broken spaceship and collect things you can use for crafting or cooking. You even make friends with some alien species. Haven is incredibly charming, and the way you move around the world is so smooth and engaging. It makes the most of your duo's relationship, allowing you to play the game co-op and having crafting and even combat be based on timing actions from both characters. But even when playing alone, there are so many cute little touches, like how you and Kay will hold hands while gliding around or embrace if left idle. Haven can sometimes be a little repetitive, but that can be a good thing when you're looking for a game to relax with. Also, the soundtrack is amazing. Game number six has some of the best environmental storytelling I've ever seen, and uses photography as its main mechanic. When Aura Game Digital's Umarangi Generation starts, you're given a camera and told how to use it. You play a courier, sent around to various locations to make deliveries. In each one, you're given a list of things to photograph. Maybe it's a skateboard, or snapping nine candles in a single frame, or maybe it's capturing a giant robot with a zoom lens. As you finish deliveries, you get new lenses and effects to use to make your photos more creative. And as you pay attention to your surroundings and look around more, you learn about what's going on here. You can see the inspiration from real-life events like the New Zealand bushfires and this year's pandemic when you look around the game and see environmental devastation, people in masks, and the posters and graffiti calling out military occupation. Umarangi shows a bleak, bleak world, even as it's set against bright colors and upbeat music. The game feels very timely and like a good representation of the year. The way the story is told, almost without any words at all, is very impressive, and it's worth checking out for yourself. Number 5 is topping many lists this year and is from one of my favorite developers. Hades is a brilliant spectacle. I can always count on Supergiant Games to make the best looking and sounding games out there and this is no exception. As Zagreus, the son of Hades, you're determined to escape the underworld, but it won't be easy. You'll have to fight your way through many enemies and some friends as well. Then you'll die, and try it again. The characters you encounter in the underworld are great, from the gods of Olympus who are all competing for your favor, to the employees of Hades who are trying to stop you. The conversations are compelling, with so much unique dialogue and the character designs are so, so good. I loved slowly learning more about all of them. And they're all really hot. The combat in the game is fun, with tons of variation based on what weapon you choose and which boons offered from the gods you accept, making each run quite different. Hades' roguelike nature is what's keeping it from being higher on my list, though it did hold my attention for quite a long time. Number four is a game that lets you build and explore, but also teaches the importance of letting go. Spiritfarer by Thunder Lotus Games was a real cozy delight. You play Stella, who is tasked with ferrying the spirits of the deceased to their afterlife. 
And while that sounds like a sad concept, it's a really beautiful, earnest, and even uplifting game. While you're finding spirits to ferry, you're also building up your boat, giving access to new areas and collecting materials to make new things. You can garden, fish, cook, smelt metals, and take care of farm animals. You help your spirit fares to complete any unfinished business and also try to keep them happy with their favorite meals and sometimes a nice hug. This game has excellent hug animations, I can almost feel them. And if you want to play with a friend, player two can control your cat Daffodil, who always follows you around. Spiritfarer is a lovely combination of management sim with exploration and a good deal of story mixed in. Being able to travel to different towns, meet, talk to, and even hug people whenever I wanted definitely filled a void that was present this year. This was the perfect before-bed game to wind down with. While everyone was waiting for Cyberpunk to come out, another neon open-world metropolis came out in April, and it's my number three game of the year. Cloudpunk by Ionlands lets you play as Rania, a driver for the Cloudpunk delivery service. She's an outsider here, new to the city of Novalis, and has to quickly learn how things work in order to survive in it. The gameplay involves driving around in your flying car, picking up deliveries and sometimes passengers, as well as wandering around the city on foot. As with most cyberpunk worlds, this is a corrupt place where corporations are more important than people. But it's also not a place without hope. Rania meets people and androids who are trying to do good, and you have a chance to help them. Some of the side quests in Cloudpunk really stood out with some pointed and humorous writing, and the game has one of my favorite companions from any game this year, your dog, Camus. Or rather, your dog AI, who you had to install into your vehicle because you needed to sell his robot dog body for the money. Camus is like your conscience, always questioning your actions and why the world is the way it is, while also trying to reconcile his dog mind with his car body, and he was absolutely delightful. Number 2 was one of my most anticipated games this year, and it did not disappoint. It's the stunning follow-up to one of my top games from 2015. Ori and the Will of the Wisps from Moon Studios is one of the most beautiful games of the year. The whole thing looks like an intricately animated oil painting. Ori is a delight to control as you glide, soar, and launch yourself through the world. It's such a fluid movement system where you can often go a long time without ever touching the ground. This game expands upon combat with more weapons to choose from and a large hub area that you can build up and return to to talk to some of the characters you meet along the way. It also has autosaves, unlike the last one. Thank goodness. The environments in Ori are such a joy to explore and span from icy mountains to fiery volcanoes, arid deserts, and of course, shimmering forests. I love the progression of abilities gained and the inclusion of some really excellent boss fights to test your mastery of Ori's movement. The game's chase scenes are the real standout for me, and though very challenging, they also kept my heart thumping and were immensely satisfying to finish. My number one game is something I played just recently, but more than any other game this year, I just couldn't put it down until it was done. Paradise Killer by Kaizen Gameworks is quite unlike anything I've played before. It combines open world exploration and platforming, collectibles, detective work, and visual novel with some excellent vaporwave aesthetics. You play Lady Love Dies, an immortal investigator called upon to solve the crime to end all crimes. The world this game takes place in is endlessly interesting. Paradise is an island which was created to resurrect fallen gods by using the energies of the citizens trapped within it. 
However, all this energy attracts the attention of demons, which eventually corrupt the island and force its creators to scrap it and try again. You need to solve the murder of the island's council on the eve of the birth of a new and supposedly perfect island. You do this by interrogating the people left behind, examining the crime scene, and always being on the lookout for evidence. The facts and the truth may not be the same. Paradise Killer has a beautiful and intriguing cast of characters to interact with, along with some excellent writing and a world that's not huge but is densely packed with secrets and little tidbits of lore. It's all very open-ended, meaning you could very well miss things before you finally present your case against the killer to the judge. I loved exploring this island and learning everything I possibly could about its inhabitants, as well as slowly uncovering what a nightmare scenario the entire place was. As I said, I couldn't put this game down once I started it, and that's why, in the world according to Pam, Paradise Killer is the best game of 2020. So those are my top 10 games of the year. I really hope you enjoyed and hopefully found a new game or two to add to your own list of games to play. Leave me a comment and let me know what some of your favorites were. I hope everyone has a very happy new year and here's to a better 2021. If you want to see more, check out my games of the year from 2019, which I really think was one of the best ever years in gaming. Or watch another of my videos. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.